Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Juan Villanueva. Thank you, Sasha, for introducing me. I'm a type designer and educator based in New York City. Uh, I'm really honored and grateful to be here today. Uh, and again, huge thanks to Kara, Sasha, and the whole team at Typographics for having me here today. Uh, so this slide uh, summarizes my journey in weaving my practice of type design and teaching uh, together for the past six years. And today I'm going to be talking about how type design education is important not only to level up your skills, but also to possibly shape the design discourse and find your voice in this vast and competitive field of design. But before I start, I want to show you a little bit about where I'm from. Um, I was born in Lima, Peru. I speak Spanish, and I have an accent. And that is Lima, a city that is full of life, where people like my family who live there, they work really hard to make ends meet. And it's a place also that's full of letter forms of many different kinds that I, I like to think that are also working really hard and shouting sometimes to communicate their message. And as a kid, you know, this kind of like letter forms helped me navigate the city. And as a type designer now, I see a lot of, uh, you know, potential for new different typefaces that I could be working on. But now that you know about me, uh, let's talk about type education. Is there a tradition in type education? Uh, let's see. Uh, this is the cover of, uh, I won't read the name in German, <laughs> but it's the, the Type Founder in Silhouette, uh, a portfolio of 25 prints uh, made by Rudolf Koch in 1928. Rudolf Koch was a German uh, calligrapher and type designer. He designed Neuland, Cabell, you might be familiar with those. And uh, these are two of the pages from inside of that portfolio. Uh, so this kind of like the, shows the process for making type at the Klinsport Type Foundry in Germany. And I love how he is able to take his aesthetic sensibilities from calligraphy and translating those into illustration and carrying the same level of expressiveness. And I also like the fact that these are silhouettes, uh, showing off you know, his mastery of uh, form with positive and negative space, and giving the same emphasis to the, to the people depicted in those images and also to the equipment. And these are sequences from a 1957 film, Graves and Files, made by Canadian type designer Carl Dare, documenting the last days of metal type at the Enschede Type Foundry in the Netherlands. And it's an important piece of design history, or type design history, and it depicts what I would consider the tradition uh, in type design education for the past 500 years. So you basically had to get a mentor and hope that they would be kind and generous enough to uh, share their knowledge, skills, and profits with you. Right, you'll be a competitor. Um, this is a famous letter from William Adinson Duggins to Rudolf Rusica, where Duggins is sharing some very valuable insight into the process of designing type. I assigned this reading to my type design students uh, because although the technologies for making type have dramatically changed in the past 10, 15 years, the principles still remain the same. And it's only in the past, again, 12 to 15 years that type design education has become formalized and has flourished in various places around the world, mainly in Europe. So this tradition of an apprenticeship that, uh, which for centuries had kept type design in obscurity is now being replaced by new methodologies and new pedagogies that are being developed by new programs uh, that are redefining what a tradition in type design education actually means. And the proliferation of type design education would not be possible without the democratization of the tools that we use to make type. Looking back at Carl Dare's film from 1957, you can see that type was very physical. You could actually get hurt. I love this scene because it shows the level of craftsmanship involved in shaping one single letter. Uh, you had to be intentional and precise because if you made a mistake, you probably had to start all over. There is no command Z in here. And the process for testing type also wasn't easy, as it is now. There was no export or test install. Um, it was let. But these days, all you need is a computer, a lot of patience, uh, the discipline to figure out the puzzle that it is designing a typeface. And here is Matthew Carter, patiently drawing an uppercase letter A. And every time I draw an A, I think of him. This is an image of my own desktop during type at Cooper. Uh, back when I used Rolofont. And from left to right, you can see sort of like my process for drawing, spacing, and then testing uh, my typeface on, you know, uh, I guess, publishing application. 
And these are all part of the process of making type. And these are some of the applications that type designers use today. I learned to draw type in RoboFont. Uh, I use Monotype now. I use Glyphs 3 now that I work at Monotype. And even though I don't use FontLab uh, as an educator, it's very important for me to be familiar with it because uh, it's the only application, at least of the three, that it's being supported in Windows. So it's useful to know your way around it. And having access to the tools for making type uh, and having access to education has really transformed our field. Uh, it enabled me, a cool kid from Peru, to study typeface design at the only program teaching type design in the United States back in 2013. Uh, you might be familiar with this building. Uh, it's across the street. <laughs> and apart from looking cool and experimental, um, this building is a place for learning. Uh, we had our weekend workshops in there, and this is where we had our type design classes. Uh, this is actually in the top floor of this building, uh, only accessible via the round elevator. And you know, time flies when you're working on type, especially when you have a big clock next to you. Um, so going to type at Cooper taught me the skills for making type, which allowed me to develop my own opinions and explore my own perspective on the subject. These are some of the projects that I worked on and started during that year. I didn't get much sleep. I'll leave it at that. This was my graduation project, which was a very personal design, a semi-serif design called Gregorio. And it was named after Gregor Samsa, so the protagonist of Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis. And I think of Gregorio as Gregor Samsa's Latin American double. Uh, at the time, you know, I, was, I felt a connection with Franz Kafka in the sense that I was trying to reconcile my Peruvian identity with the new life that I was making here in the United States. And at Type at Cooper, we focused 100% on learning how to make type. I think this focus was really amazing, especially because it allowed me to connect and embrace the mentorship of my instructors, who you see on the screen, and you'll also see around uh, the conference. Uh, so I'm very grateful to all of them, because they not only introduced me to the craft and the discipline, but also the first creative community, uh, which was you know, the cohort of that year. And this is the class of 2013, 2014. We're a bunch of nerds, uh, highly motivated to make type. And it's, this is really a special place, having people like this to kind of like uh, feed, feed energy off each other. So everyone was really talented in different disciplines, which make everything really exciting. Uh, but you know, having access to New York City and the means to obtain this specialized education is only one type of access. It's a very privileged access that not everyone has. So access for me is also about creating opportunities and making what's missing a reality. In 2020, I started teaching type design at Type at Cooper. And this felt like a logical um, kind of progression in my type design career as a teacher. And it also forced me to come to terms with this. I'll give you a second to read it. Um, just in case this wasn't clear, uh, these are not type designers. They're just uh, <laughs> all white men. Uh, but you know, this is the reality of my field. It's predominantly made up of white men. Um, and while there are more designers out there, of course, uh, for the most part, they haven't yet been given the opportunities, mentorship, or the spotlight to succeed. So I started a fund to raise money to give BIPOC designers a seat in my class and also cover their materials. And running this fund was a big learning experience uh, from working on the campaign to actually you know, figuring out how to make the selections. And the hardest thing was really you know, trying to choose five students out of the 50 plus applicants that would apply every time. It was a huge responsibility. I asked people for advice, mainly my mentors, and you know, had to make some tough choices. So I did it four times. And this, you know, this class taught me and allowed me to connect with more than 20 scholarship students and just students in general from all over the world. And it's their enthusiasm for type and the opportunity to study a type at Cooper that not only enriched the classroom experience, but also challenged me as an instructor to make the lessons more accessible and to fine tune my approach to collaboration in an online environment. This is some of the work from my Latin American students. Uh, they will always have a place in my heart. For me, teaching a class was less about teaching the a more a way of connecting more deeply with the communities and designers from around the world through our common interest in type. And in the grand scheme of things, you know, teaching the skills of type design is not that hard. 
um, showing them how type design can be a part of their practice and genuinely connecting with them and supporting their growth, that is really where my heart is. So getting involved with learning communities, especially from underrepresented groups, can really expose you to a lot of talented people that you could you know, recommend for work or even hire if you're in that position. So teaching this class did that for me. Uh, so if you're looking to hire talented designers uh, with solid type design skills, uh, reach out. <laughs> I know more than a few people I could connect you with. Um, and in, in a very similar way, uh, databases can be powerful tools for bringing people together. Uh, so you can probably tell that Latin America has a very special place in my heart. Uh, so in order for me to highlight the work that's coming from there, uh, I started a project called Typefaces as Cultural Objects, which is a resource that collects and highlights typefaces uh, and letter forms made by Latin American designers that are um, sort of like trying to preserve and honor Latin American culture. Um, Ancho was one of them. You, you saw it recently. So feel free to check out typelatan.com. And just remember, you, know, you don't have to wait until it's Hispanic Heritage Month to hire or license type from Latin American designers. Uh, so reflecting back on my education and the kind of opportunities I've had to meet and interact with various people and communities in New York City uh, made me realize that you know, there is really no reason we couldn't foster these kind of interactions and relationships online. Uh, the pandemic and the sudden shift to an online environment helped develop the infrastructure uh, to normalize these kinds of interactions, so I created TypeGrid Crew. Uh, and it's a free resource for type design students to meet one-on-one -on -one with virtual, uh, virtually with experienced type designers for virtual critiques. And you know, I was basically thinking of what would have been helpful for me as a student studying type. Uh, so I launched this in 2020. I put out a call for instructors and to sign up. And within a day, you know, there were more than 30 people already you know, offering their calendars to talk to students, just to get in touch with them. And seeing that kind of support and openness, you know, it's very heartwarming. And I got to say, type designers are very generous people in general. So this made it kind of develop a framework for interactions. And our goals at Type Crew are to make type design and type designers uh, more accessible and approachable to students of all levels and anywhere in the world. To do our part as instructors to make our field more inclusive and diverse by putting ourselves out there. And to ultimately you know, spread our passion and love for type because we do really love this weird thing, which is letters. Um, and I've been lucky to meet students from all over the world. And some of them have become my students and collaborators. And every time I meet someone, uh, it reminds me of how awesome type as a discipline is how much talent there is out there, and how cool it is to learn from each other and also meet new people. And if you want to learn more about this initiative, um, check out this website, <laughs> typegridcrew.com. Our guidelines are available in seven languages, thanks to the um, support of our instructors. And if you're interested in type as a career or as a skill you might want to learn, let's catch up after my talk. Um, you can go to Typegrid Crew, look at my calendar, book a meeting with me, and let's, let's chat. Uh, I also printed out stickers. <laughs> if you want to come get me after this, I'll, I'm happy to give you one. So why study type in the first place, right? That is the question. Uh, I guess first because it's cool. Type design is really cool. Um, but also because if you're like me and you identify with that kid on the meme, <laughs> right, learning type design will improve your sensitivity towards looking and working with type. Uh, it will make you a better designer, period. Uh, learning type design would enable you to unlock that superpower of being able to shape type, which is the fabric that holds design together. And you know, these are the kinds of letters that I draw for fun in the evening. After wrapping up the client work for the day, I make experimental letter forms that no one really is asking for, uh, except me. I'm trying to kind of like create new problems that I get to solve. This is how I keep myself interested. Um, and searching for this balance between functionality and expressiveness uh, has helped me also figure out my own voice in the world of type and design. And I think one takeaway from doing this personal work is that once I started sharing it online, people started to reach out with comments, and it allowed me to connect with a wider network of people, mainly other designers who were also interested in this kind of like experimental letter forms. Um, and this was, has helped me reach a different kind of community around the world. And in contrast, this is the kind of work I do during the day at Monotype. 
Um, I've been very fortunate to have had the opportunity to work on very large type design projects with a talented team of type designers, some of whom are here in the audience today. Uh, so I love working on these projects you know, as much as making experimental letter forms. They both teach me things that are different and that are essential for growing and becoming a better designer. And I'm showing you this to make the point that, for me, it's not really about one or the other. It's about finding the connections between the different kinds of work and building a sort of bridge between them. So starting in the US, I learned about Emigre magazine. I love Emigre. I was fascinated by the critical and experimental approach to type and graphic design. Um, so you can only imagine when I found out there was a similar magazine for Latin America that also existed around the same time, but no one told me about it. That's Typographica. So now when I teach, you know, I tell the story of Emigre alongside the story of Typographica from Argentina and how they both were widely influential in the development of typography and graphic design in the American continent at large. So you won't find that story in any of these books. In fact, these books only show one side of the story, a perspective on design that is centered on whiteness and comes exclusively from our Western European canon and is a very narrow lens from which to view the world. This question wasn't really a shocking realization, but it did leave me wondering if perhaps there was a different way in which things could be different. Uh, presented an opportunity more than anything else to actually look deeper and beyond what I had been taught in school all these years. And acknowledge that, you know, the sign books are, can be insufficient. Um, and to appreciate history, you actually have to go uh, out of your comfort zone and study it in a global context. These are some of the publications that come from Latin America, each telling their own history, in their own accent, in their own voice. And no one really knows this, but I've been researching the history of typography in Peru since I started teaching in 2016. And I didn't really mean to keep it a secret, it's just that I didn't really have anyone to talk to about it. Um, until I met another type designer from Peru who was also interested in that history, and we became friends. And we started nerding out together, you know, about this topic. Only two people cared. Um, so last year, the Bike Book Design History team, led by Salas Monroe, uh, reached out and they asked me if I'd be interested in being part of the lineup, develop a new course for the history of Latin American design curated by Ramon Tejada, who is one of my mentors. So I said yes in a heartbeat. Uh, immediately started you know, gathering all my research, and in October of last year, I taught a class on typography and language in Peru, starting from indigenous writing systems up until the typographic scene of 2021, so up until the moment I gave the talk, basically. And I'm really proud of this class because it gave me a platform to connect with Peruvian designers uh, from all over, right? The diasporic aspect of, of it as well is really important. And it helped me connect with my Peruvian heritage and also uh, use my unique expertise in type to be able to contribute my voice to the many histories of design. And, you know, again, I literally made the class that I wish I had when I was in college. And in the spirit of making things accessible, I shared all of my bibliography and research through a Notion page at perutype.com so that people interested in sort of like picking up the threads, uh, they can you know, feel welcome to, to do that and feel welcome to connect with me. So hopefully by this point, you get the idea that you know, for me, education in type design is more than teaching or learning the skills of making type. It's a way to become part of the discourse and shape the history and landscape of the practice. Uh, so I want to show my biggest ongoing project to date, uh, which is the current class of Type West Online. We recently, <laughs> some of them are here today. Uh, we recently finished our first term together. Uh, where we focused on our Type Revival project, which is a very common assignment for uh, full year type design classes. Um, so in addition to focusing on observing and drawing, uh, which is you know, the very foundation of this exercise, we focused, also focused on researching historical sources and studying the context from where they came from to inform our design decisions when digitizing and making our revival. Um, you can see some of the work from the first term at typerevivals.com. Um, and keep in mind that these are not finished typefaces. Um, that said, the class really went above and beyond, and the work and research shown here is excellent, uh, done in 10 weeks. So check out their work, their video presentations, show them some love, and basically, I hope that it inspires you to dive deeper into the world of type, maybe take a design, type design class, and just learn more about type. So 
So with that, I want to say thank you all so much for being here. Uh, Thank uh -huh.